Well, our next speaker, uh, Mike Arduzer, uh, had a long career with the uh, Missouri Department of Conservation. He is uh, an expert in, in native bees, and he's going to uh, well, spend some time telling us about uh, some of the work with okay, native thanks, bees in Missouri. Everybody hear me okay? okay? All those pictures of cake made me hungry. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, we'll probably run a little after, after I talk, Nadia will talk. It'll probably be a little afternoon when we wrap up, ready for lunch. So. Uh, just hang in there and just dream about cake. Yeah, yeah I've been sitting here and I've been hearing a lot of emphasis on agriculture, the importance of pollinators in agriculture today. Rightfully so. We're very selfish species and that, that pollinators are incredibly important to our, the way we live. But in the same way, they're every bit as important to all, so many of the wildlife species out there. Just one quick example. Goldfinch, you all know the American goldfinch. Interesting bird, nests real late in season, our latest nesting passerine, largely depends on seeds from various uh, species of plants in the Asteraceae. And most of those are insect pollinated, and most of them are ob obligately bee pollinated. Second, if you've ever looked at the nest of a goldfinch, inside of it, it is usually lined with thistle down. Thistle is an obligately insect pollinated plant, largely by bees. So here's a case, just one simple case, of a bird, common bird, beautiful bird we all know and love, depending on pollinators totally. That bird would not exist if it weren't for native pollinators. So um, just want to put, put that out there. We're going to take a pretty deep dive into Missouri's bee fauna. And uh, and along the way, reemphasize a lot of the things that you've already heard this morning. But if you're like me, I need, need to hear things three or four times before it sinks in. So uh, that's part of the point. Bee conservation is, has a lot of components, really, when you think about it. And we've talked about a lot of them today. Uh, something that's unusual, though, about conservation of bees writ large that's different from bird conservation or herp conservation is that, yeah, we want to conserve individual bee species. but the pollination services that bees as a whole provide are of inestimable value. And that's an additional conservation target. It's the conservation of individual bee species and the conservation of pollination services are not necessarily the same thing. And we'll emphasize that a little bit later. Uh, about 30 years ago, we started a basically a Missouri bee project. And uh, the very simple, straightforward, set of objectives. We just want to know what's here, where it is, roughly how abundant it is, where it is on the landscape, what some of the floral relationships are, and ultimately we want to be able to say, you know, are, are our bees secure or not? Which ones need help? It's a pretty straightforward set of methods like you would do pretty much any, any project. We do have some long-term monitoring sites in Missouri for bees. Um, um, I didn't work alone. See, uh, I, think, I think the only person on this list is not on the list is my mom. And I need to fix that. But the point is, uh, I owe these people a tremendous debt of gratitude because they loaned, gave me data. They went out in the hot sun and got data. I, they let me use their photographs, on and on and on. There's a, this, it's a tremendous uh, bunch of people here, some of are in the audience right here. And I do want to mention, too, that um, the museum here, the Enz Entomological Museum, was a tre tremendous resource for us as we started this because uh, it's been well curated. It's got a good bunch of large bee, bee collection, and we got a head start by working through the, the, what the bees that were in that collection. So it was incredibly important. Bee collections in museums around the country are hugely valuable, and I'll return to that at the end, but uh, they deserve our support big time. So here's, this is basically where we're at. It's kind of weird to boil 30 years of work into one slide. And that's <laughs> kind of pathetic in a way, but that's what we've got. So I'm going to walk you through this and what we're going to explore in some detail. These are the families. Don't worry too much about that because this changes every 10 years, it seems like. <laughs> uh, the genera stay pretty consistent. So we've got 58 genera in, in Missouri. What does that mean? Uh, California has um, quite a few more than that. Uh, but still, 58 is about normal for Illinois, Indiana. Most Midwestern states have a similar number of, of genera. A lot of species. Uh, this keeps changing. Just, just this past year alone, uh, 
people working in St. Louis and at Dunn Ranch up in northwest Missouri found a seven species of bees that we've never found in Missouri before. So obviously, we're still finding stuff. Uh, this undetermined thing means that there are still species out there without scientific names. We have a number of undescribed species in the Ozarks, and uh, so that's where we're at. I mean, we're still learning a lot about bees, even in the Midwest. Uh, a lot of lit record, lit, literature records in the distant past, stuff that's 80, 90, 100 years old that we have not been able to confirm. These are species that presumably at one time were reported as here, but we can't find any, any real evidence of that other than what's in the literature. We do have some introduced exotic species, not many, um, but there are some. Now, this is what I want to concentrate on, this string right at the top here. Oligo, oligo means oligolectic. Oligolectic bees are the specialists, the pollen specialists, whose lives are intimately tied to a particular group of plants. Could be a genus, a couple of genera, maybe even a single species in some cases. So these are very specialized bees, and as a result of that, they have to be very good at tracking the blooming phenology of their plants. Otherwise, if, they're, if they emerge a week or two late, they're screwed. I mean, they, they have to be on the same schedule as their plants are. And how a bee that's two feet underground knows that, you tell me. We don't really have, that, that's still somewhat of a mystery. So there are a lot of legalectic species in the state. That's a third of our fauna are species of bees that depend exclusively on certain kinds of plants. And most of these are only in flight for two or three weeks. If you're not there at the right time, you don't find them. Many of them are t closely tied to natural communities that have uh, some of these conservative plants. So we'll, we'll explore this in a little more detail. Here's a range of, a just general range of pollen specialization in, in the Missouri and Midwestern bee fauna. You've got species down here, very few, that are entirely dependent on one species of plant. This is, uh, oops. And then it goes up. Way up here, you have these little green sweat bees that you all got in your garden, you've all been stung by. They're everywhere, incredibly common throughout the Midwest, and they visit everything, literally, any kind of plant. And then it's in between, you have a range of things that maybe specialize on the genus, the Penstemon bee, uh, Caledes Roberts and I specializes on a couple legumes, on and on and on. It's, this is one that specializes on bell, American bellflower, Campanula americanic, very common uh, plant in the Midwest. And uh, this is its main host. Beautiful. Now here is, here's a breakdown of the plant families and the genera in Missouri that host specialist bees. And uh, you probably can read most of it, but you'll notice a couple things. First of all, there's a lot of them, a lot of families. And there's really no clear relationship. I mean, it's not like this, these families are all in one part of the angiosperms. They're scattered all over the place. You notice this, though. In the Asteraceae, there are over 50 species of specialist bees in Missouri that specialize in some kind of Asteraceae. And it blows away everything else. Um, these highlighted things, yellow, are woody taxa that host specialist bees. And there aren't that many, but they are significant. The, uh, willows that had been mentioned earlier. So uh, the, many of these plants are common uh, in, the tr in the nursery trade as well. You can plant them. Uh, it's not necessarily true, though, that if you plant them, they will come. Some of them will, but we've had a number of these cases where, uh, well, Echinacea, that's a plant everybody plants. Echinacea pallida or Angustifolia, one of the, the uh, uh, prairie species. It's planted everywhere. There's a host a bee species that specializes solely on echinacea in the Midwest, and it's, we've never found it at plantings or at restorations or reconstructions, only on prairie remnants. More on that in a minute. Here's one, this is one of the polylectic bees. Polylectic is the kind of the opposite of oligolectic. Polylectic species are, well, like the honeybee. I mean, they literally go to almost anything, and there are degrees of that, too. There's some polyelectric species that don't really go to everything, but almost everything. This is a little tiny sweat bee, lazy gloss and prunosum, common on our western prairies and, and glades. Now these are woody, exclusively woody plant taxa that, that support the, the, the polyelectric bees. And you notice almost anything is on this list. And a couple of things that are wind pollinated. You wouldn't think that uh, oaks and some of these wind pollinated species that don't have 
insect pollinated flowers, they're still used extensively by some of these polylectic species. Oak, you know, an oak tree is just loaded with food if you're a polylectic bee. So oak trees do get, oak pollen does get utilized by some of our species, as well as some of these others. So, yes, back to this again. This, klepto, uh, <laughs> that's kind of, well, it's kind of self-evident. It stands for kleptoparasitic. And if you think of a cowbird, then you'll understand what this means. Uh, our kleptoparasitic bees, and 20% of our fauna is, is kleptoparasitic bees. These are species that don't make their own nests. They often don't visit flowers much, often very rare. They, they attack and parasitize, really, the nests of other bees. They, well, no, what they parasitize, really, is not the bee themselves, but their labor and their effort. So kleptoparasitic bees get into the nest of a legitimate bee and lay, the, and somehow, by various contrivances, put their egg on or near the pollen mass of that legitimate bee. The egg hatches, and in most cases, the, the larvae of the kleptoparasitic bee grows quicker, more quickly, and often has big, big mandibles um, for killing. A normal bee, whether it's a honeybee or a bumblebee larvae or a leafcutter bee larvae, they, they are just fat grubs. The mandibles are minuscule. They have, they're just balls of protoplasm sitting there. The larvae of most parasitic bees, not that way. They're sharks. The first time I ever saw one of these, I opened a nest and uh, under a microscope to look at the pollen mass, and in it was one of these kleptoparasitic bee larvae swimming through the pollen just like a sea serpent. Big mandibles come. So they're, they're, their job is to kill the host larvae, or host egg. And then, again, you notice there are a huge number of them. And uh, what, one question that always comes to mind is, well, I mean, are these bad? I mean, they're killing our, there are they're, they're local, in instances of local population suffering, but in terms of the bigger, bigger spectrum, it's curious. No, I'm not aware of any record or any, any data that suggests that kleptoparasitic bees have made another bee go poof. So there's some dynamic between them that uh, maintains both. And unlike cowbirds, our, our kleptoparasitic bees have pretty narrow host range. You know, the cowbird, I don't know how much, what we're up to now, but they, you know, parasitize nests of over 100 different kinds of bees, or birds. Most of our kleptoparasitic bees have a very, very narrow host range. In some cases, just, just one or two species. This is what they often look like. They don't look like bees at all. They look more like wasps. They're not hairy. You know, one of the hallmark of bees is that they're hairy and to trap pollen. Well, most of our parasitic bees, not all of them, but most of them, are very, have very few hairs, uh, don't have the pollen collecting accoutrements that all the female bees have. They are slender, they just don't, they don't look like bees. Then we have this. Uh, NCD stands for natural community dependent. Another way of thinking that's remnant dependent. There are a, lot of, a number of phrases that are used to, to, for this feature. That these are bees that, as far as we can tell, are largely dependent on our existing natural communities. They're not in cities, they're not in backyards, they're not at the edge of the road. The only place we can find them with any, uh, any regularity is in our natural communities, what, be they prairies, glades, wetlands, music forests. And that's, look, at, there's a pretty large number. Now, um, the, uh, this is where most of our species of conservation concern are going to end up. They're obviously in this group. These are species that have pretty narrow ecological tolerances, and they need very specific things. Sometimes it's a certain soil type. Um, this is the blue sage bee. This is one of these natural community dependent species. This is, uh, that's the wrong, this should be Cressoniana, but it's Tetraloniella, Cressoniana, blue sage bee. It's got a couple things. It only collects pollen from this plant, blue sage. Um, beautiful bee, flies a million miles an hour, hard to catch. And it's only, it's only on our southwestern prairies, uh, prairies that are managed by Prairie Foundation or MBC and some others. So our southwestern prairies in the Osage Plains are the only place where this bee occurs. These are remnant prairies. And they don't, we haven't, the only reconstructions that we found them at are in, in uh, Nebraska when a reconstruction is placed exactly right next to a remnant. And then there's seamless 
uh, movement across those two, which is a pretty good suggestion of where we should be doing our reconstructions. Uh, these are a bunch of bees that nest in sand, exclusively, only in sand. And this is just a short list. And in this part, well, I, I grew up in Michigan, the Great Lakes, where there's sand everywhere. Uh, here, our, in, this, in this part of the Midwest, you know, our sands are really restricted to our larger rivers, our repairing corridors and alluvial benches and that sort of thing. It's the only place you find these, nowhere else. So these are very restricted uh, in, in Missouri. It only occurred in a few, few places. You know, our, our remnant com communities, our remnant prairies, glades, forests, these are our touchstones to diversity. And without them, and without the appropriate management, we're, we're flying blind, folks, not just for bees, but for other groups of organisms, too. Our remnants are the closest that we can get to the pre-settlement era. Not that they haven't been disturbed, they certainly have. Um, but they're all we've got. And we need more of them. Well, when they're out there, they need to be conserved as much as possible. And uh, we're, this state is lucky. If we go east of here and go to Illinois and Indiana and Ohio, they just drool over us. Because we, we were able, through the efforts of Conservation Department, Missouri Prairie Foundation, and others, to conserve a lot of these remnants. It's like an archipelago out there. And uh, you know, you dream of the day when these can all be connected in some way. And that's, that's another subject. Well, if we know what we've got, that's good. But how do we know if some of that stuff is disappearing, if we're losing things? You know, if we don't have a really good baseline, again, it's, you know, there's some struggles there. And again, museums have saved the day here uh, because, because of the length of time at, at these ag schools like MU and Ohio State and other places, there's the specimens in these drawers go back decades and decades and decades, and in some cases, way back. Uh, this is a guy, this, this isn't Missouri, this is across the river in Illinois, but very close to St. Louis. Charles Robertson was a dapper guy in the late 1800s, professor, doctor, you know, one of those guys that did everything they, that people did back then. He also collected bees, and he was a great botanist. So from 1890 to 1915 or 20, he went around in a 10-mile radius, very systematically collecting bees, identifying what plants they were on, putting them in the Illinois Natural History Museum, where they are today. So this is the only instance in the whole country where we have a database, baseline data that goes back this far. And that's, you know, 1890s, that's when things started to really get, in terms of agriculture, really change. So his data set is incredibly valuable, and it's been mined by several people. So he originally published it on his own. Um, I think this is on the web. Um, and then in the late, in 1970, 71, 72, John Marlin and uh, Wally LaBerge resampled everything he did. Not only did Robertson leave specimens, he left detailed notes of where he went, when he went, how much time he spent. And the guy was, I guess we'd call, what's the word we call that guy today? Yeah. <laughs> Well, thank God for him, because I mean, his data is really important. So John and, and Wally did this, did this study, published late, published in 2000 or so. <clears throat> well, what they're, this is when the whole bees are falling from the sky thing started happening, right around 2000. That was the reason they did this restudy of Robertson's data, to see how things compared over that 100-year period. And they found almost all the bees that Robertson did. So Carlinville is like you know, the little town that time forgot. Nothing much changes there. And so in the early 70s, it was still, um, there were still prairie remnants there and a few other things. Well, time passed, and uh, just a few years ago, Laura Burkle and, uh, and Tiffany Knight, with John's help, subsampled uh, the same thing. They went up to Carlinville and subsampled the spring fauna, bee fauna. And their interpretations were quite different. Uh, this is a, you can find this as a good study in science. I didn't put the, yeah, the whole, sorry, the whole citation isn't up there. Yeah, it is. Anyway, um, so in their interpretation, things aren't looking so good over there. And there are a number of things they couldn't find. And also the, what they refer to as the networks, the connections between the various plants and the various bees that Robertson found, they found fewer connections. So it's like a fabric that is kind of slowly falling apart, was their interpretation. So that, that's a little worrisome, really. 
And they're, they're, we're going to be resampling that here in the next couple of years again. But uh, so there's some suggestions there that, that maybe, maybe this pollinator client is, is uh, so maybe there's some, something really going on there. So what do we, what do, we do about it? Uh, what we can do in, here and this, is just come up with a monitoring, monitoring program, and a very simple one. So where, you, where you've got to keep track of how much time and effort you spend sampling somewhere, presumably on some of these long-term monitoring sites. Here's the next, this is Friendly Prairie, owned by the uh, Missouri Prairie Foundation, um, one of their earliest acquisitions. This is, this gives you an idea. In 88, we sampled for 11 days, total of 83 hours, there were three of us. 2010, I was the only one, none of those people helped me. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, uh, so uh, we spent exactly half the amount of time. And so, you know, here's the number of bees we collected per hour, pretty similar in those two. And again, this is a span of time, 22 years. And these two, these prairie, these prairie remnants. We found fewer bees in 2010 species than we did in 88. We'll talk more about this in a minute. Uh, there are ways also to measure abundance, uh, relative abundance, overall abundance. This is this, a data set from the same set of prairies. And I want to spend a couple minutes on this one because it uh, illustrates a couple points. In 1988, we found 111 species of bees on these two prairies, 40, a 40 acre prairie and an 80 acre prairie. These are remnants, managed remnants, with, managed with fire at the time and sometimes haying. Well, of those 111 species, just a handful amount to almost half of them. And we find this over and over again when we're, we're sampling our natural communities, not just prairies in the Midwest, but all types of natural communities. You end up with a preponderance of generalists. That is, most of the bees, the individual bees you collect, no matter what method you use, are generalist species that are on the landscape most of the growing season visit a lot of different plants. The rest of that 101 or whatever it is, these are largely bees that are short flight periods, visit a restricted number of plants, are kleptoparasites, and it's hard to escape the conclusion that these are the main movers of pollen on our natural communities. It's not all these rare species. They're intrinsically valuable, obviously, like John Muir said, but in terms of pollination services, it's these common general species that are doing the lion's share of the work. It's, it's hard to avoid. And there are numerous pollination uh, studies that sort of demonstrate the same thing, at least in the Midwest. So now fast forward to 2010, you know, 87 species, hmm, that's, that's a drop, noticeable drop. Well, in this intervening time, what had happened was it, it was a management decision to remove all the woody plants on these prairies. That includes all the dogwoods, all the dogwood thickets, the plum thickets, and the uh, sumac thickets. All of the, I don't know if you remember the list, but all of those, pl those plants support a huge number of polyelectric bees and some specialists. They're very important. That explains this discrepancy between 111 and 87, or most of it. Then you don't notice that the other interesting thing is largely, there's those, those two years, very similar species in terms of dominance. Not much changed there. What changed were the specialists and kleptoparasites whose, whose plants were removed. The other thing is that Bombus grizzicolis, one of our most common bumblebees in the Midwest, present at more or less the same levels those t in those two years, 22 years apart. In 1988, Bombus pennsylvanicus, often called the American bumblebee, was the dominant bumblebee on these prairies. We could hardly find it in 2010. And that's not just us. That's, you know, these are just a couple sites. But this, is, this phenomenon is occurring throughout the Midwest. And again, museums come into play. Just a few years ago, Sydney Cameron and her uh, associates at the University of Illinois mined museums around the Midwest for bumblebee data going way back. And they found, well, more than this, but they definitely uh, demonstrated that Bombus pennsylvanicus is one of these species that's on the edge of, of becoming very, very scarce. It used to be the dominant species in a large part of the Midwest. Bumblebees are hugely important pollinators, so we don't want that to happen. Networks are another thing we can monitor. You can basically, we know what specialists, bee specialists should be at certain groups of plants. To the extent they are present, that's good. To the extent they're absent, that's not so good. Why is that? So that's what uh, observed versus expected means. There are magnet species of plants that suck in everything, just like a Walmart. And, <laughs> and, 
and uh, these can be used as monitors as well, because if, 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 if you go to Minarda or one of our native thistles or Dahlia purpurea and there aren't many bees, there's a reason for that. And so that's a, that's a, a way to, to monitor bee abundance and species on an area. This is the other uh, very interesting thing that we've, that we've found is that in our natural communities, there is a relationship between the pollen generalists, the specialists, and the kleptoparasites. This means that a, oh, a black oak savanna along the Great Lakes, whether it's near Chicago or in Ohio, those natural communities have the same proportion of generalists, specialists, and kleptoparasites. Not necessarily the same species, the same proportions. And we're finding this over and over in different types of natural communities in the Midwest. Uh, this is Neil Smith Refuge up in Iowa, and this is a, a big prairie restoration. It's done, started over 20 years ago, and when it was started, it was largely ag ground. There wasn't much there at all. Now, we don't have any bee data from that time, but, I mean, there was soybeans and corn and not much else. So over this period of time, what has happened is that the pollen, pollen generalists and pollen specialists and the kleptoparasites, that those proportions have recovered to uh, uh, approximate most of the proportions that we find on a native remnant prairie. So restorations or reconstructions can work in maybe a short amount of time than we used to think. Um, I was going to say something else about that. And uh, Oh, yeah. If we did, I didn't put this up there, but if you measure reconstructions or restorations in the first year or two, I mean, they're almost all specialist bees, very few uh, generalist bees, very few specialists, very few kleptoparasites. Same is true for urban environments, but largely dominated by generalist, pollen generalists and exotics uh, with relatively few specialists and uh, kleptoparasites. And that doesn't seem to recover. There's a lot of turnover, but the proportions that we find in our natural communities uh, don't seem to occur in these more disturbed, disturbed environments. I don't know what that means. I'm just saying that's something we found. Proportion, uh, yep, we do have some exotic species. This is the giant resin bee, and it isn't quite that big, but it's pretty big. <laughs> and it's, and it's well-named. This is a wool carter bee. This is very aggressive. This is a male. You see this little spine sticking out. If you want to have fun, if you've got a teenager at home and needs something to do, give him a golf ball, tell him to go out to the garden and look at the lambs here sage and just to toss a ball around, these bees will chase anything. Uh, cheap entertainment, you know, cheap entertainment. <laughs> and, and we do have, I won't go into this in too de do much detail, but we do, in addition to Bombus pennsylvanicus, which is clearly should be a species of concern, um, we do have a number of other wetland species. There's a suite of, of wetland species that occur nowhere else, in our, in, except in our wetlands along the Missouri and Mississippi rivers. Uh, and uh, we do have some endemics. This is a Dianthidium subrufulum. The, the, the type was described from Branson, if you can believe that. And believe it or not, it's still there. And it only occurs in the Ozarks and the, uh, northern Washita Mountains. Um, Bombus affinis, which we, we have one or two records from Missouri. This is one of those. This is being considered for federal listing at the moment. So anyway, uh, thank you very much. Um, and I'll be around today. And uh, if you want to Collect bees, uh, let me know and I'll give you that. So, <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Mike. Uh, any, any questions or comments for, for, for a speaker? We have a few minutes for that. You were talking about the exotic species, the be exotic native. Uh, I mean, exotic bees, and I observe that in our urban gardens. They're, they're so abundant, they, especially a bumblebee. I don't remember the name, but there is another kind of a leaf cutter bee yep. that we found out that they are exotic, but I, I, we don't know what to do. We put the right, ha the right plants, and we create the habitat, but what do we do? Yeah, that's a great question. I, you know, we, m most of these almost all of the ex exotic bees in North America have arrived in the last two decades. I mean, not dis that's discounting the honeybee and a couple other things, but if you look at the curve of exotic bees arriving to this country, it just goes zoom like that in the last couple, 10 years. And there is, we are, you know, a lot of states are kind of paying attention to this, but they are largely, like you've just mentioned, largely confined at this point in time to urban disturbed sites. If you wanted to go find a that giant resin bee and the anthidium, I wouldn't go to a native prairie. You're not going to find them there. 
and hopefully it will stay that way, but based on what we've seen in other exotic animals and plants, I, I kind of doubt that. So I don't know why these things won't, what's restricting them now. They may, some of them do like the, the, old, the, the plants from the old world that people grow in their gardens. That's what they're used to. That's what they gravitate towards, but you know. So I think we need to just monitor them, pay attention to them, see what happens. If they do get in our natural communities, what that means, I don't know. We'll see. So thanks, Donnie. Hey, Mike, uh, one question up here. Could you recommend a good resource for a beginner at identifying bees and bumblebees? A uh, bumblebees, yes. I mean, the web is full of free stuff. But uh, if you want to pay 30 bucks, there are Paul Williams and several other bumblebee experts just published a bum Bumblebees of North America. And it is, throw all your other bee, bumblebee guides away. Uh, it is really good. Uh, it's, it, it can be as complicated as you want. There are good photographs. Uh, our, our bumblebee fauna in the Midwest is very limited. They're pretty easy to learn, and uh, that book is a great help. But there's also fr free literature on the web. If you just Google bumblebees of the Midwest, you'll find lots of, lots of cool stuff. The bigger picture, bees as a whole, uh, you know, the challenge is, you know, hundreds and hundreds and thousands and thousands of bees. How do you, how do you deal with that? So a new book just came out uh, called The Bees in Your Backyard. Uh, it's probably it. I mean, it just literally it just came out a couple months ago, and I don't know if but it's, it's the kind of book that I'm sure it's going to be at Barnes and Noble and these kind of places. It's a beautiful, beautiful book. It won't help you identify bees to species necessarily, but you, it's, it will, you will learn all the genera, which is the best place to start. It's a great book, loaded with other great information. Xerxes has some good stuff too that, that uh, on bees at the genus level. So it, this stuff's out there. Okay, we have time for one last question uh, there in the back. Yep. Okay. Uh, what percentage of your pollinators, bee pollinators, require some type of other vegetation in the grass? Speaking to the mic, please. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. What, other, what percentage require trees or other type of vegetation for nesting. You for know. nesting. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, uh, the percentage isn't quite as high here as it is in, in uh, California, but about 20% of our of the species in, in the, let's say, the greater Midwest, including Missouri, don't nest in the ground. They either nest in dead wood, down in dead wood, old beetle, beetle borings, sumac canes, elderberry canes, that sort of pithy, pithy stems, and there are a few that nest in, all, in cavities under rocks or in rocks, so just general cavity nesters. Any cavity will do. And then there are a couple that actually make freestanding nests composed of resin and some other things on, on twigs. So I'm probably forgetting something else. But so a, a good a and, and that would also go with your other natural pollinators, such as butterflies and such. No, no, that's one of the interesting things. Cut me off if you need to. One of the uh, very important things about bees, and I'm glad you brought this up in terms of what they reveal to us or tell us about our environmental change is they have so many types of nesting substrates. Butterflies, I hate to say a butterfly is a butterfly is a butterfly, but they all are larvae that eat plants above ground. They don't make nests. Okay. Bees do all kinds of things. And so different groups of bees respond differently to different environmental disturbance. And that detail can be very informative. Okay, I'm from North Texas. and. What has changed in our, our environment over the years, they've essentially cut down all the trees. That area was probably a natural savanna with trees. You know, your post oak savannas, your blackland prairies were made up of a lot of trees and grasses. Now, I imagine yeah. it makes a big difference I, in I, what's yeah, it would, there today. It would transform the fauna, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for that question, and thanks, Mike. Oh.